demonstrate the ways in which labour would seek to achieve that shift. Of course, in the world outside labour conference, I don't know if any of you have been following the news, and um, there are some rather big developments going on in the economy, um, with things moving at warp speed, uh, talk of Bank of England intervention to support the pound, and we might uh, get into some of those uh, some of those issues as well. I think just to kick us off, I think one thing is very clear: there's now a lot of economic ground to fight on and stake out. Um, and indeed, I think the economy is going to be the key issue at the next general election. Uh, so for that reason, I'm thrilled that we've got Rachel Reeves, Charlie Chancellor of the Exchequer, with us today. Um, and really looking forward to talking about your, your speech, Rachel, and your plan. I'm also delighted to be joined by Tina McKenzie, who is Chair of UK Policy and Advocacy at the Federation of Small Business. Um, we're going to be having a bit of a conversation uh, amongst ourselves. And then I will come to you for questions. So please be thinking as we're talking about what you'd like to ask, um, as I'd like to get a really good set of questions in. So to kick this off, uh, firstly, Rachel, congratulations on your speech today. Um, you talked about it in it about several big themes, so public investment and a public return through the wealth fund, a social partnership approach uh, with um, a national economic council and strong public services for a strong economy. Now, this was music to our ears, because it's lots of things that I think has been calling for and pushing for for many years, so we're delighted to see them. What is the thing that you most want people, indeed voters, to take away from your speech today, and who are you most hoping is listening? Uh, thanks very much, Karis, for hosting um, us today, and, and thank you also to the huge amount of support that IPPR provides in the rain the neutral way um, and we're very grateful for, for, for that and you might see some of it reflected in some of the announcements today uh, in the in the conference speech um, I, I think that when i started writing this speech back um, in the early summer no one could have anticipated the environment in which i was delivering it today and look I, i'm the sort of person who i don't have essay crises i write things well in advance but so uh, we did have a bit of an essay crisis uh, this morning uh, when i woke up at, at 5 30 uh, to prepare for my morning media round to see that the pound was not a 37 year uh, low uh, against the dollar which is where it was well on friday when markets closed but now at an all-time uh, low and people are not just against the dollar but also against the euro as well and so you know, I want people to know that we would invest in doctors and nurses, that we would create the National Wealth Fund, uh, that we would, um, the, the, we don't believe that trickle down economics is the way to create growth that comes from the bottom up in the middle out. But look, if I'm honest, what I want people to know is that I'll be a responsible chancellor, because I think that is what families, pensioners and businesses all around the country want to know right now that there is somebody there ready to take over who will get a grip of the situation that we face right now because the Tories are out of control. They've got the wrong priorities. And some of you may have seen that the Chancellor has just said that by the 23rd of November, we'll set out his plans uh, for fiscal responsibility. The 23rd of November. Now, is he looking at what's happening in financial markets? Has he noticed the reaction to his fiscal statement on Friday? It's grossly irresponsible. Because a fall in the pound means higher inflation uh, as the cost of imports rise, including the price of petrol that is priced in dollars. And it also means, and we're already seeing this, higher borrowing costs for government. And in turn, that means higher borrowing costs for all of us through higher mortgage rates, higher uh, business uh, borrowing costs. And so the, the real world consequences of the chances of mini budget on Friday will impact on all of us. And so what I want people to know today about me is that I would be a responsible chancellor who would act in the national interest and get a grip of the problems caused by the irresponsibility of the chancellor on Friday. And I guess building on that, how much of, uh, if you did work for the government, how much of that would be a job of repair? And how much would you be able to get to the, the ambitious program that you set up? Well, I think the two things go in partnership because what you need is a, a plan for, uh, for financial stability. That is a foundation for economic confidence and a growing economy. But you also need a plan for growth. That is the one thing that I will agree with Boston Party on. 
that the lack of growth over the last 12 years is one of the biggest causes of the problems that we face today. That the lack of money for public services, the cost of living uh, crisis, uh, are caused in large part by an economy that's not growing. And I welcome the commitment by Posse Party to get to 2.5% of growth. The growth rate seen under the last Labour government. That is welcome. What is lacking is a credible plan to deliver that sort of economic growth because it doesn't come from giving tax cuts just to those of the rich. It doesn't come from uh, allowing bankers to be paid larger bonuses. It doesn't come from adding £50 billion pounds to the national debt every single year. It comes from an approach that says that growth comes from the bottom up and the middle out, uh, through the factory worker, the shop worker, the doctor, the nurse, and the teacher. And it comes from working in partnership with businesses, big and small, to see some of the opportunities, which is what the National Wealth Fund is all about. And so, as Chancellor, I would uh, ensure that there was a plan for financial stability and we set out levers fiscal rules last year at a conference uh, but also a credible plan for growth so that people can see a way through the current paralysis. I want to get into the details of some of that plan in a moment and um, before we do before we do I just wanted to ask one other question which is about the inspiration for lots of the people in your speech. So I noticed the Boston bottom up middle out phrase, which of course has been used by Biden and indeed Obama in the US. Um, I also felt there was a Wilsonian element with the sounds and sights of the future arriving. What are your kind of inspirations uh, of successful progressive uh, economic policy? Um, Yes, well, it, it was good to see uh, Labour spokesperson Joseph Biden last week coming out and saying that trickle down economics uh, that doesn't work. Uh, it's good to see his own message. Uh, but, it, but it's absolutely true. And it is an insight in the US and the UK and uh, around the world that this has been tried before and it has failed. And it will fail this time as well. And in fact, it's failing at pretty record speed uh, because. The the, the 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 measures set out in the fiscal statement in, in Friday on Friday is leading to higher government borrowing costs, higher borrowing costs for everyone else, and uh, weaker pounds and so higher uh, inflation. So before the tax cuts have even come in, it, it is already um, uh, stifling. Um, uh, uh, it's already set to stifle investment and growth in the economy. So I do look around the world, whether that is to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Germany, or the US for inspiration. And it's fantastic to see that the centre-left governments coming to power all around the world. And I hope that we can replicate that uh, here in the UK um, uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as possible, certainly in the next um, couple of years. But you also heard me speak in the, um, the speech today about people, about my mum and dad and their commitment to public service as, as teachers, about my experience of, of growing up in the 80s and 90s at my local state school. And my experience at secondary school was our sixth form was a couple of pre hub huts playground. Our library was turned into a classroom because there were more students than there was space and there were never enough textbooks to go around. And my children are at local school today and you see so many of the history, so much of history repeating itself today with schools without the resources, with children uh, coming from, uh, from, 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 from backgrounds of poverty in school and starting school without the benefits of the sure start and the children's centres that uh, Labour um, invested in uh, to give people the best possible start in life. And, and I also spoke about a constituent a pensioner who I met in April this year, who, when I went out to shake her hands, when I reached out to shake her hand, her hand, her hand was purple and, and freezing cold. And I spoke about a family I met in Worthing, where the mum and dad between them were working five jobs, had half a day a week together with their young child, and felt that the chance of home ownership was falling further out of reach. So, yes, my inspiration comes from political leaders, uh, both in the UK and uh, internationally, but also from the people that um, I meet and have met, and um, my own family background um, as well. And, you know, if I think about what success will look like for an incoming Labour government, it will be more stories of meeting families and businesses and pensioners who talk about the opportunities they've got, uh, about their hope for the future, rather than the fear, which is just too often present in uh, families, pensioners and businesses who I speak to today. And I think that fear is exacerbated by what we saw on Friday and what has materialised in the couple of days since then.
I wonder if you might turn to uh, the relationship with business, and particularly if we've got Tina here, I'd love to bring you in, Tina. And um, I mean, perhaps Tina, you could start by saying kind of what you heard in Rachel's speech, and then we can go into um, some, of, some of the details. Um, yeah, I thought this it was a good speech. I really liked, I mean, I'm thinking about what Rachel said last year in Brighton, and so much has happened in a year. And you announced last year that you would look at small business ritually, that you would increase it to 25,000 and take 200,000 of the smallest businesses out of a tax that they have to pay even before they've opened their door or made a penny. And that doesn't make sense to us and that doesn't help business, small, smallest business or startups or the high streets and the list goes on. So we were delighted if you'd listen to us then. And listening to your speech and the tone of your speech, you know, sometimes um, when I listen to Labour's speeches, there's a lot about the workers, but there's not necessarily a lot about business. And sometimes it'd be like in the media, people like to pit business against workers and really what you were saying is it's you know it's two sides of the same coin you know the cost of living crisis the other side of that is the cost of doing business prices and you know 99 percent of small and medium businesses in the uk 99 percent of businesses are smes in the uk 63 percent of the people in work are employed by those small businesses they're our neighbors they're the people going home sometimes on a friday night not even paying never mind a minimum wage they're going home on a Friday night sometimes when they want not to get paid out of the three, four, five staff that they've got. So, you know, I was relieved to hear definitely. I feel like there's a real change in the journey that Labour's been on even in the last 12 months, and that's really, I think, ultimately, we've got, you know, a lot of small businesses out there aren't like us watching the news today and saying, oh, my God, look at the currency drop and drop and drop, because they're generally out there working their jobs and they don't have time to be sitting with the news on looking at currency. They also, you know, expect us as, re as responsible leaders to be making the decisions to help them in terms of how they get a good economy, a buoyant economy. And the problems, there's a long list of problems from the energy crisis, now to currency, this fear that we will put up interest rates again because all that does is put up a lot of their debt. And, you know, big businesses can hedge a lot of this, small businesses can't, but it's going to be tough for everyone. I think also the labour market, and I really want to talk to Rachel much, much more about the fact that, you know, as a responsible government, when and if Labour get back in, um, I'd like to talk about the 8 million people that are economically inactive. So many of them want to be back at work. So many women without the provision of childcare, a reasonable cost of childcare, and you all know that, but also so many people lingering on waiting lists, not getting the healthcare that they need. Those people, a lot of them want to get back into work again as well. So we have a labour market shortage. We've got a skill shortage. We're frightened about what's going to happen with the interest rates. There's a shortage of cash. Businesses aren't getting the cash they need to continue. And we're worried about that. We're asking now for a crisis. And, and I'm glad to hear you talk about that as well. We're asking now for some crisis funds to help the smallest businesses. Now, all that being said, it is really, really important for us to hear labour talk about the long term. What is the vision for growing investment what is the vision for this country of small businesses if we're saying that you know so much of the employment is wrapped up in it and I, most businesses say they want to go to net zero what are we going to do around health and green for businesses and we've asked for vouchers for that but equally most businesses want to pay their staff well and you'll find that the average wage of small businesses is higher than the minimum wage a lot of them are on more than a living wage and so that doesn't worry us actually but the question is what do we do around supporting those businesses so they still have the funds in order they can pay well, in order that they can grow and thrive and continue to employ so many of our citizens across the UK. But definitely I'm delighted by the change in tone and I'm sorry if that sounds a bit, but, and I think the things we're hearing are good. I'm just desperate to get Rachel to commit to some more. <laughs> but they, I know this will, oh, well, you'll hear more. I hear Keir Starmer always, well, you'll hear more when we get to the time when it's election, we're not going to let all of our secrets out. But I actually think that we with the Labour Party could really aspire to get some more definite plans in place before we get to 2024. So let's, you know, and that's when you get the trust and the confidence of the business community that you get us. I know you do, but you really want to help us grow and develop this. You know, there's so much great about this economy. There are wonderful things about our economy. Um, not least the people that tried it. So I think that I'd like to see more, but I think it's, it was a brilliant speech and I was really pleased with it. Great, thank you. And there's some big issues there to pick apart. I guess perhaps starting with the challenges of small business and facing 
Rachel, I mean, uh, so much approach you wanted to you. Um, how would Labour's approach support those businesses to thrive? Well, Tina mentioned Labour policy on business rights, and the Chancellor, in his statement on Friday, uh, committed to cutting corporation tax. But as Tina said, the business rates are paid whether you make a penny of, of um, profit, even a penny of, of turnover. And when I talk to businesses, and I spend an awful lot of time doing that, it's really inspiring. But the tax issues that come up are business rates and properly targeted investment allowances to invest in those things that will improve productivity and our growth rates as an economy. And that's why I've made that my priority. The reforms that I've spoken about in terms of business rates would help 900,000 businesses next year. The government's um, promises around corporation tax would help less than 100,000 businesses. And the businesses that our policies would particularly support are the smaller businesses and the medium-sized businesses. We certainly want a level playing field uh, with the online giants and then uh, their larger competitors. And that's what we want to see as well, which my, I've made it our flagship policy uh, in terms of, of, our, of our business strategy. Business rates, properly targeted investment allowances, investment in skills, making the apprenticeship levy uh, work. I mean, at the moment, the apprenticeship levy is a nightmare for big businesses, let alone smaller businesses. We know that there's a real skill shortage in our economy, and yet the apprenticeship levy it is just like another tax for many businesses. You have to pay, but you're not getting nothing in return. That's such a huge missed opportunity to be training up, not just young people, but people who want to reskill and change a profession as well. So I think you'll hear a bit more about that uh, and about our skills um, uh, um, strategy and our ideas for equipping people with the skills of the future, mm -hmm. because when I talk about Labour's Green Prosperity Plan and our National Wealth Fund and our ambitions for uh, solar and wind and hydrogen and nuclear and carbon capture and storage, that is going to require people with the skills to deliver those projects and the scale of that ambition. So the skills are also an important part of the agenda for small businesses and for the wider ambition of an incoming Labour government. And there'll be more about that, in more detail about that uh, later in the week. And the other uh, thing issue that Tina raised there is, of course, the labour market and imaging the health. Um, and I think we have done some analysis of the labour market and found there are about a million people missing compared to what you would have expected from the pandemic. Of those, about 400,000 are not in the labour market because of health issues. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we're thinking about is how we improve health in the district. Mm -hmm. um, and you sort of alluded to that with your public services and the speech, Rachel, but is there anything you want to kind of draw out in terms of those approaches then? So Jonathan Ashworth, um, that was the large focus of what he spoke about on the conference floor earlier today about that missing million people from the labour market. You know, Tina touched on one issue, which is lack of affordable childcare for the families, particularly women. There are so many more women who would like to work, would like to work at all, but often would like to work more hours or in a higher paid job, but they can't find a childcare uh, to be able to, to do that. So we do need a, a childcare system that enables more women in particular to be part of the labour market and fulfil fill their potential in the labour market. And you guys make an important point about how our health system needs to um, ensure that more people are uh, fit and able to work because I think, as you say, around half of the people who are missing from the labour market are missing because of some sort of long-term uh, illness or condition. It may be long COVID. It may be that they're one of the 8 million people waiting for uh, a hospital operation. It may just be that they are waiting for a doctor's um, appointment and a diagnosis. But you know, the truth is, without strong public services, whether it's the schools and the skills policy or the doctors and nurses, you're not going to have the strong economy that we need. And uh, Yvette Cooper will be speaking, I think, on um, Monday tomorrow or, or Wednesday. She will also make the point that you need community policing and uh, an, an action on, on, on crime and law and order in our neighbourhoods as well to ensure that we have vibrant high streets and vibrant town centres because that's often a barrier for people going out and feeling confident uh, both in the daytime economy but also in the evening economy as well. But the point is, is, is that a strong economy is built on the foundations of, um, um, of, of, of responsibility, and I spoke a lot today about financial institutions, but also on strong public services. And the two do go hand in hand. The idea that the Chancellor espouses 
really just cut access for those at the, the very top and somehow everybody else will eventually feel the benefit uh, it is misguided and our approach is very different and you know i think i said at the statement on, on friday it's not just a, a, a clash of policies it is a clash of ideas about the way in which you grow an economy and provide the economic security that people desperately crave right now it was also, of course, a very uh, green speech, and the theme of this conference has been extremely green. Does that mean that the environment is now firmly at the heart of Labour's agenda? Um, and how will that relate to the other big priorities that we're also going to, to set out for uh, manifesto? But if you look at the, the big challenges we face at the moment, we've got a cost of living crisis and we've got a growth crisis. Uh, in addition to all the other crises that uh, are, are around us, but we probably haven't got that long. But if you take those, those, those two, uh, the cost of living crisis, yes, of course, it is caused um, in part by Putin's uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine. But we are uniquely exposed in Britain because a, a failure over the last decade to insulate homes, a, a failure to invest in renewables and nuclear energy, and the grossly irresponsible decision to close our gas storage facilities, the decision of Kwasi Kwarteng as energy minister. And so we do need to make ourselves more resilient to the economy and society by investing in those industries of the future to boost our energy security so we are less reliant on imported gas from Russia and elsewhere, uh, and that we have more homegrown energy. So it is in part a solution uh, to, uh, to tackling the, the, the security uh, of energy and also the price of energy. But also when I, I think of, of climate change, of course I see a moral responsibility. My kids are nine and seven. When I told them, I, I did rehearse a bit of my conference speech uh, on my nine-year-old daughter, who until I got the bit, the bit about the greener economy was, I've got to say, uh, falling asleep. But she really, that, um, that, that bit really excited her. And it's not just young people. I think people do want something for the future. And I do think we have a moral responsibility. But when I think of the climate transition, I also think about the massive opportunity there is for us as a country. Because of our industrial heritage, because of our geography, we have a huge opportunity to get the jobs and investment here. But it does require a government to act as a partner to business to seize those opportunities, because there is a global base on for those jobs and industries of the future. And other governments are working in partnership to invest in those industries. And unless we get a move on, and get serious about this, but we'll find that in the years to come, that we'll be importing cars rather than exporting them because we failed to get the uh, electric uh, vehicle battery factories here, that we will be importing green steel because we failed to get green steel in Scunthorpe, in Sheffield, in Port Talbot and elsewhere. And we'll find that the, the wind turbines that are going up and will go up all around the country will continue to be made thousands of miles away rather than here in Britain. So look, I see it as a moral responsibility, but I also see it as a massive economic opportunity and a really good example of what I speak about when I say that it's got to be a partnership approach between government and business. And Tina, how do your members view this? Is, you know, do they also see it as an opportunity? Is the bills issue the thing that's first and foremost in their minds? No, they've been saying we, we pulled them on it and we've written a full report on it as well. And basically, small businesses, they want to do it. Again, they all have kids, they're living in the local communities, they know what the dangers are. The challenge for them is even things like when, when they look to insulation or solars or whatever, the value on the property can go up is that going to put the rates up and you know so they need some support with it and they need to get hand in glove with government in terms of how to go how to go about it but the, the opportunity for the country you're absolutely spot on i think the opportunity for the country are looking at renewables look at you you talked about battery storage because we have a lot of renewables but it's the battery storage that we really need to keep it here and you know and not ship it out, out elsewhere so i think that it's a huge industrial like a new industrial revolution for us the green economy and small businesses will be hand in hand because we need to retrain those gas fitters uh, into you know into these new industries and it's a huge opportunity especially for the kids that aren't going to university because you know we're, yes we're sending a lot of kids to university but we're also feeling a lot of kids that aren't getting to university that where their apprenticeship scheme may not be working well for them and this is a perfect opportunity to give them good skills good jobs and get the country independent and kind of autonomous with its energy you know, so it's a, I think it's a no-brainer. Is that the plan, Rachel? 
to get those to get people with the skills into those jobs. Yeah, absolutely. We won't achieve the ambition that we've got to get clean power by 2030 to have the National Wealth Fund to uh, create the, the green steel, the hydrogen, green hydrogen electrolyzer, um, the, uh, the 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 ports that are ready, renewable ready. We, we won't do that unless we've got people with the skills. They're not going to just, you know, government invest and it materialises. You're going to need the people yeah. with the skills to, to do it. And I was at, um, I was at Optimus Energy in, in Slam recently, and I met some of the apprentices there who were going to be doing the retrofitting of homes. And I, I asked them, you know, why they had decided to come to this apprenticeship at, um, at Optimus Energy and what they've been doing before. They'd all come from a whole range of, of different things before. Some of them are young, some of them were retraining. And they said two things primarily. First of all, they said, there's a lot of work here. They think it is a, a career, not just the work for a, a few years. And they were excited about that. But also they said, and I guess this is about, you know, my nine-year-old daughter as well. They said they wanted to do something where they felt they were making a difference. So I, I think that the, the opportunities are there in these industries of the future. Young people, older people retraining will seize those opportunities, but we've got to make sure that those opportunities are available. But, you know, the plan for clean power by 2030 is really ambitious. It's not just going to happen by chance, and it's going to require a skills programme alongside an investment programme. And we've heard the same uh, in communities that we've worked for the Department of our Environmental Justice Commission um, in Tees Valley, in Aberdeenshire, in South Wales, in Thurrock. And people can feel excited or hopeful about the future, uh, a green future, so long as they can see what they're saying. Just on that, something I think that really fits well with the Labour Party is, you know, a lot of young people are not going into the friendships because of the pay rate. You know, in some parts of the country, they're being paid three pounds seventy an hour on the apprenticeship schemes, and that's I don't think that doesn't sit well with us. And in fact, there's such a labour shortage, and you know we've one and a half million jobs out there on film. They can go and get a job at nine pounds twenty five an hour at the age of seventeen. So why that? Why I'm just gonna say that right there. Why on earth are we paying them three pounds sixty? I think we've got to look at that in order to keep them in the apprenticeship program and get them doing the right thing for the long term future. And then before we go to audience questions. There's one last thing that I did want to pick up on because I think it's so exciting, which is well done. Um, and the, the reason why I think that's particularly exciting is that it encapsulates the principle that yes, the public should, uh, the public sector should invest, but there should also be a stake for that have been done so. Um, so Rachel, how, how would that work? How would it be different to what we have today? So we could have had a sovereign wealth fund from the money from the North Sea oil and gas, but that was squandered. But Norway didn't make that mistake and they created a sovereign wealth fund and they have invested in the assets and made a return for their taxpayers and their citizens. Imagine what we could have done if we had taken the same approach. Now, today, if we are going to seize those opportunities and get those jobs in those industries and those factories, we're going to need to invest at scale to be able to do that. But if we do that, as you say, Carries, if the British taxpayer is investing, they should get a return on that investment. And so, you know, I want to support those industries, but I also want to be hard-headed about it as well. If you're putting taxpayers' money in, I want to see a return. Other investors expect to see a return. British taxpayers expect to see one as well. So we put that money in, but we would invest it working with the UK infrastructure uh, bank, and then that money would flow back into the Treasury as the returns from those schemes uh, come to fruition. So it'd be done in partnership with business uh, to see some of the those opportunities that we're missing out on today because other countries are uh, stepping in and supporting and then that money will flow back into the into the treasury and if you're interested in reading about wealth funds uh we pulled the one back in our commission on economic justice in 2018 um so that sets out from how they can be governed and so on uh, if that's of interest um i'm going to turn now to audience questions i'm going to take a few at a time to put the set of hands there is a mic coming around as well, they might have been there with us in this Um So I'll start with one of the, these two on right here, and then we'll try and not make you run around. <laughs> Thank you. It's Masato Kimura, Japanese journalist. So, uh, Trasnomix is uh, uh, to some extent like uh, Abenomix, who is a very, very tiny. And so, to uh, uh, modern monetary theory, do you have any opinion on uh, modern monetary theory uh, in this bad timing? Okay. 
here, and I think Rossi. Um, thanks. My name is Kathleen I'm in the Whittington constituency in Manchester. Uh, so the hospital where I work today was running on a bed occupancy of what over one hundred percent, and I just think what our A and E weights were. And this is a result, obviously, of twelve years of no investment, and the fix for that is not quick. No quick fix for that. So my worry is that when we when we have an incoming Labour government. People are going to want to see some improvements. And I wonder if you could tell us maybe two or three quick improvements that people might see economically with a Labour government that you know we can maybe talk about this is what you're going to see in the first few weeks rather than months or years. Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, Rachel, uh, thank you for a fabulous speech. Uh, I have seen and heard many. And I think it's for the first time that I'm seeing uh, the Labour Party uh, with this sort of uh, confidence, specificity, and clarity. So I do agree with you that and you a great speech. I have just retired from the Foreign Office, having served as our ambassador in various places. And I've done that with a tremendous amount of pride in Britain. And today I don't feel like that. Anymore. Um, when somebody approached me and said, oh, Britain, you know, is not the country where they are relying on, on, on food bins and supermarkets. I argued back passionately, I think he was wrong. This one's so long. And now we've arrived in a situation where our children are going hungry and we're going cold. And this horrible story of this lady with a, with a green hand, because she's that's about to this is where we've arrived. So we're going to need everything that you have said, but faster. <laughs> this transformation into the green economy, it's not about green, it's about the economy transformation. And it was great to hear Ed talk about doing things by 2030, getting all the energy onto green and all the rest of it. But I think it's gonna go faster and getting manufacturing back here. In my time in representing Britain, we just couldn't get British, enough British businesses to supply anything. We'd have the ideas and then we'd have to buy from somewhere else. So when we are when we are doing the the wind farms, when we're doing the solar panels, what are you going to do to make sure that the manufacturing is here and it's our people who are who have actually produced these things there? What is specific? Perfect. There? So three uh, questions there, one on uh, MMT, one on uh, the quick improvements um, if, if you came into government, uh, and then one on manufacturing. Yes, so um, on monetary policy, I don't know if you know, but my first job when I was at the Bank of England was as the uh, Japan economist, uh, and that was back in 2000. But maybe a bit niche, um, <laughs> but it was a time when Japan had zero interest rates and was starting to pursue quantitative uh, easing. Uh, some of the similar issues that the UK then went through um, a, a decade um, later. What is unique about the situation we are today in the UK economy is you've got monetary and fiscal policy pulling in totally the opposite direction. You've got a, a stimulus package worth 50 billion pounds, a regressive stimulus package that disproportionately helps those who are better off. And then you've got the Bank of England with their inflation targets who are trying to, uh, to, to, to take demand out of the economy with interest rate prices, which will disproportionately hurt those who are in debt, uh, not just in mortgages, but also people with credit card debt, etc. So you've got um, a, 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 um, a regressive fiscal stimulus and monetary tightening happening in the same time. It's a recipe for disaster. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, I, I welcome the fact that the, uh, the Bank of England have, have spoken today uh, that they will act it if, if needed. But frankly, it's having to react because of what the Treasury did, what the Chancellor did on Friday. And we need a, a Chancellor who is also pursuing responsible economic policies in a way that we just don't have today. Um, in, in your question, and thank you for the work that you do in the hospital in, in, in Winnington, um, Wales will speak at uh, conference on Wednesday or Wednesday morning with a little bit more about how we get through this winter. Uh, and that's important. And I've done similar on how we will get through this winter with the cost of living crisis. But you're also right to say that 
the sticking plaster approach, whether it is for the NHS or for the cost of living crisis, is necessary because of the stage that the, uh, the, the NHS and our economy is in. But a sticking plaster approach is not sufficient. We've got to start, even if it takes a long time, even if it takes a while, we've got to invest in the workforce in the NHS. And that's why today I said, you know, we're not going to cut the top rate tax from 45 to 40p. We would use that money for 5,000 new health visitors, 10,000 district nurses, uh, the additional nursing and midwifery places, and the biggest expansion in medical school places in um, the NHS history. And it's sort of saying the cavalry is coming. So those of you who work in the NHS today, it's not going to continue like this. We know we can't deliver those doctors and nurses um, overnight, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't get started now, because it's a bit like... My answer to the previous um, question, I think Harris's uh, qu question, imagine how much better prepared we would have been for the cost of living crisis if we'd been insulating homes and investing in renewables. Imagine how better prepared for the pandemic and for this winter crisis we would have been if this government had been investing in our workforce um, in the National Health Service. Finally, in, in answer to your question about uh, pride in, um, in, in Britain, I think you're absolutely absolutely right the the inequality in society uh, it, it frays the, the 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 ties that bind us together as an economy I, I remember when the spirit level was published 10 or so years ago um unequal societies are less successful economies it was true then look what's happened since we've become a more unequal country and our country has not grown as an economy there's, there's a causation here. Uh, if you are concentrating wealth and income amongst such a small group of people, you're not going to be able to sustainably grow the economy. So it makes sense for the economy, as well as being, and we're Labour people here, as well as being a moral responsibility um, as well. The growth, um, even if you can get it, I don't think you can, by just making the rich richer, it is not fair, and it's not the sort of growth that we want to see, we want to see growth that lifts people up, that gives people opportunities, whoever they are and wherever they live. The government aren't even trying to do that. And I think that really is an indictment of, of, on them. And I just to say this as well, I've been an MP now for 12 and a half years. I've been terrible timing to become a Labour MP, 12 and a half years of, of opposition, but I have not felt as optimistic about the prospects for our party as I have in the last few months. I feel at this conference there is a real hunger for Labour to win again, because we know that we have got a responsibility. We cannot have another five years of Conservative government and all the damage that they will do to people's living standards, to our, our NHS, to our schools, to our standing in the world. And I've got to say, this conference, although the backdrop is a backdrop that is terrible for our country, has given me the confidence that we can and we will win again. And when we win again, we will transform the lives of people in this country and make our country a fairer and more equal one. By the way, if you want another child for birth, it's not being promised. It's probably the last few weeks. Is it a free break? It is a true, absolutely. My 15-year-old has just done a GCSE. My 15-year-old has just finished a GCSE and said, Dad, if I put down just pickle economics in my paper, I would have got a great C. I, is this serious? Did you actually ask me that? <laughs> so it's a great C, GCSC, if that's the only answer you have on growth. And that's oh, a 16 year old saying <laughs> what it's worth. Dina, do you want to come in on the private and yeah. point? And then well, I, I worry a wee bit of, about not to be completely like everything's brilliant. Um, I worry a wee bit about, I think, the things that you're saying we need to do for the health service, we do need to do. Um, but I worry that it's just linked to the 40 to 45p. You know, I, I think anybody earning for 150,000 um, shouldn't have a problem with paying 45p. Most people I know that are earning that don't have a problem with it actually. Um, but I worry that is that, because there aren't that actual many people earning that amount of money in Britain today. 
And is that going to be enough? And I'm sure it's not just that, but it's that's not going to be enough to solve your problems, not even in in, in just in terms of creating 10,000 places. But I think what you're talking, what Rachel's is talking about in terms of we need more, there's no doubt we need more doctors, nurses, but I'll tell you what we do need in the short term. You know, you're talking about short term. Um, when you look at the amount of nurses that are being brought in now from places like the Philippines to other countries, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's necessarily, but in the short term, we have a real problem here in the UK in that the cost of bringing workers in, we know as a small business community, when we're looking for specific skills that we can't get, we can't bring people in because of the cost and the bureaucracy currently, and we're asking for the migration system to be re-looked at. And I think you have to be brave with that, for the skills. Of, do you care, you know, if you need a doctor, you know, you need a doctor, and I don't think anybody would have a problem with you, if a doctor wants to come to the UK and work here or a nurse. So I think we've got to look at migration again um, in the short term to help with some of those problems. Great, I'm taking another round of questions. It's an awful lot. Um, I will start at the back uh, in the white shirt. Uh, Sonia Puma, um, Edmonton CLP. How can Labour heal the wounds of Brexit to improve trade with our neighbours? Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think there's one just behind you in Brown. Yeah, I can echo the um, you know, praise of the speech about you know, it really is a distinct difference in ideas between what we're offering and what the Tories are offering. Um, uh, I'm a sector economist. There's one thing, you know, in bad beach, you know, reaction to it can be whether we can be a bit more creative in the use of the tax regime. Um, so, for example, at the moment, we've, we've got a flat rate of corporation tax for big companies. Um, but we, you know, one of the most effective things governments can do when they're working hand in glove business is giving them a nudge. Um, you know, we've got lots of things in business to do, uh, aim for green, uh, go for a living wage, um, you know. Remunerate well from the supply chain. These are all things that you know we can track through the PAT system. These things that uh, you know have been discussed. Or was there any plans that space actually in a Thanks for being a bit cool, not too well. Uh, the gentleman here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tony Doyle. I'm an entrepreneur, and I just like to applaud Rachel on her uh, wealth because paradoxically, by a Labour government being entrepreneurial. You'll be able to be socialist. <laughs> is there a question or is it? No, it's great. Okay, one more question and the gentleman behind you. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with the excellent speech this morning. My name is Sean Mustaf. I'm a councillor in Oldham. Um, since 2008 and the crash, and, and obviously I was losing the election and the infamous, there's no money left at all. Um, I think we've not been able to shirk off. Um, Labour and the economy, uh, and it's haunted us, uh, I think, uh, for quite some time, I believe, to this day. One of the things um, that I often get frustrated with is, obviously, we, uh, we're a shadow um, cabinet, very passionate, previous shadow cabinet members have been very passionate um, in the run-up to a general election, um, and they've spoken passionately about policies. When they get asked about the detail of how those policies are going to be funded, that's when it starts to fall apart. So clearly, you know what you're talking about, Rachel. What my it's a plea, I guess, rather than a question, because it's not often we get the opportunity to have such a, a intimate conversation with yourself. Is please ensure that all the shadow cabinet, um, with regard to the policies associated with their briefs, are fully aligned to the budget element. They don't need to know it inside out, but they need to know how that's going to be paid for when questions on a, in a sort of one-to-one -one interview. Thank you. Might have into the fire a bit. <laughs> um, Rachel, do you want to take this one first? Uh, yes. So on on Brexit, I, I, I faced into it in in the speech today because it is you know the government say they will do everything to go for broke, except doing anything to fix the patchwork Brexit deal that they negotiated, which is creating extra bureaucracy for businesses, whether that is agriculture, uh, um, um, uh, food manufacturers, creative industries, financial services, professional services, you name it, there are problems with Brexit, which is making our economy uh, poorer. And I said it in the speech, some specific areas 
where we need to fix the problems, but also an approach, because I think in the end, you know, you can name all the different areas where there are problems, but it comes down to a problem, uh, to an issue of how you approach the relationship with our nearest neighbours and our biggest trading partners. And I, I would want to work in partnership um, as allies to try and get a deal that works for the British economy, for British workers and British um, businesses, rather than trying to start fights at every opportunity and, and refine old um, battles. Um, on the question uh, about the, the tax um, regime, I, I think there's merits to doing those things. There are also risks as well of overcomplicating already very complicated uh, tax system. But I've already said on um, business taxation, my priority is uh, supporting smaller businesses and high street businesses through the business rates uh, reform um, and also targeted investment allowances for businesses that are genuinely investing to make those productivity uh, improvements. But, but I think there is um, some merit to thinking about how can we support those businesses that are doing the right thing, as you say, either whether it's paying a living wage um, or, um, or, or going green. Um, Tony, on the, on the Wealth Fund, thank you very much um, for, uh, for that. Um, that's a great way of putting it, by being entrepreneurial, you can deliver uh, a, a socialist um, outcomes. And um, um, my friend from uh, Oldham, uh, look, I think you're absolutely right. But the bit of conference, my conference speech today, where delegates got to the floor was when I said that I would be a responsible chancellor uh, and that fiscal responsibility and economic and social justice go hand in hand. I think it's probably been quite a long time since the Labour conference got on its floor to or got on the uh, got on its feet to applaud fiscal responsibility. But responsibility has become a dividing line in politics in a way that it hasn't been for many many years. And we are on the right side of that debate today. We are on the side of responsible public finances, a responsible investment in the industries of the future. And as I said in the conference speech today, in our next manifesto, every policy commitment will be fully funded and fully costed. And look, there's loads of things that I would love to do. I bet if we went around this room, we could come up with things that would transform our country and make it fairer and support our public services. We all want to do that. That's why we came into this party. But if we go into the election not able to convince people that we can pay for things, then we'll be in the same mess that the Tories are in today. And so it is important that we explain how we will pay for things because we won't have that opportunity to serve unless we can convince people that they can trust us with taxpayers' money, with their money. Did you want to remember the yeah. tax point? I mean, I'm from Belfast and I've been involved for the last three years in the meetings around the protocol and some of the Brexit negotiations. So um, I, 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 for the Labour Party particularly, I think, you know, you are right. People get on, on their feet and I heard them, they were cheering. I think it's about being brave as well and about having the difficult conversations with the country and saying that, you know, from a business point of view, we need a trade date. We need a trade deal. We, it's our biggest market. You know, I know people don't want to talk about Brexit politics because Brexit's done. Well, it's not. And we need, we're saying as, as businesses, we need a trade deal. Let's have a grown up conversation about how we get on and do it and do it quickly because whilst we're in this crisis, things are just going to get worse. That's, that's the first thing. To your point about tax, I think you make some really good points. What you'll find is most small businesses in this country aren't sophisticated enough to have offshore accounts and moving things around all the countries and, you know, uh, all of that. But um, what I'd say is that the tax system is overly bureaucratic. It's very difficult. It's complex. We're making tax digital now for a lot of people around the country, especially in the rural communities. You know, they're struggling with that. They're having to pay an extra cost of an accountant. And so for me, if we can make tax simpler for people, I think, you know, you get more tax in. And to your point around, we have to, you know, prove to people we can pay for it. I think you've made a really good start, honestly. And I just think laying out some more of that sooner than 2024 will really get people behind you. And of course, we've uh, lost the Office for Tax Simplification as of Friday. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've lost what happens in the simplicity of tax. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so I'll take the one over here and then come on the next one. First, mic I can show First of all, I'd like to say how great it is to see an all-woman panel. 
Yes, we've got a lot of men asking questions, but it is great to see. Uh, I'm also from Northern Ireland, and I would like you to talk a little bit about the welfare system. So we've talked a lot about tax, but the welfare system means people who want to work cannot work. And how would you simplify the welfare system to make work work for people? Because we have one in four people economically in Africa, and that is not sustainable. Great, thank you. Uh, it's a gentleman here to speak past it, like I hope that. Yeah, thanks, and, and brilliant what you're doing, everything. I'll kind of critique some stuff I'd like to do more, but everything you're doing, I think, is brilliant. Um, last year, the government paid 85 billion in debt interest, and this year, this financial year, it'll be over 100 billion. We'll be moving possibly to health service expenditure levels of debt interest by the time we get into government. Um, we've got to try and pay that down. The richest thousand people in this country, their wealth went from 256 billion to over a trillion in the last 12 years. Um, the bond markets are telling you to balance the books. We need a wealth tax. Um, you, you mentioned Norway, really quickly, you mentioned Norway. They tax 80% of North Sea oil profits. The projected profits of our oil firms are 170 billion. 80% of that is 136 billion over two years, by the way. 80% um, of that is 136 billion. We need a, a large windfall tax because we need to balance the books. One market's coming to Great. And uh, can I squeeze into the professional welfare as well? So, our research out last week showed that um, lots of low income families are paying to work because of the cost of travel. Yeah. So, maybe yeah. if you can consider that as part of the discussion of welfare. Um, but, Rachel, would you want to answer this first? Um, yes, of course. So, I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges, to come back to what Kara spoke about earlier, is about helping those people that have left the labour market over the last few years return to it. Now, a lot of them are on benefits, and that creates a particular problem because at the moment they don't get any support through work coaches uh, or anything like that because they are not part of the welfare system. And actually, that, I think, at the moment is the biggest challenge of people who are out of the labour market, out of the welfare system, who aren't getting any of the support. I think that's a massive opportunity to help Tina uh, and the businesses that you, you represent having access to uh, a, a, a high skilled workforce because a lot of people have worked in, in the past, but also to lift the incomes of the families who um, are struggling. But you're absolutely right as well, Paris, to mention this issue uh, around childcare. Bridget will be speaking at a conference on, um, on Wednesday and she's spoken about ensuring that the childcare system works for the modern landscape of work, so flexible childcare, affordable uh, childcare. At the moment, we've got an alphabet soup of different schemes for childcare, very difficult to access that support. And also, so much childcare has uh, has, has disappeared during the, the, the pandemic, uh, closed and hasn't reopened again. And it is a real barrier uh, for, for, for women, as I said before, particularly um, in, the, in the workforce. But we know that if women return to work after maternity leave, they will over their lifetimes, um, uh, rather than taking an extra couple of years out, will over their lifetimes uh, earn more, uh, more likely to progress uh, at uh, work and have those opportunities for promotion, et cetera, in the future. So it's a really important uh, economic priority uh, is childcare. Um, on the issue that you mentioned around uh, the cost of, of servicing the, uh, the debt. You know, there's two things going on here. But first of all, the government are adding to the debt uh, 50 billion pounds a, a year, as I, I said, um, because of the unfunded tax cuts. But also, the cost of servicing that debt is going up because interest rates are going up. And everyone's focusing on what's happened to sterling over the last couple of days. Actually, the biggest uh, changes in financial markets is what's happening to, 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 to gilt prices. And people are uh, saying that if they're going to hold government debt, you pay government debt, they want to get a bigger return. Uh, on, on, on that. And the government obviously going to have to issue an awful lot more of it uh, to, to help fund their uh, tax cuts for the richest. I, I spoke in much more detail last year at a conference about uh, tax uh, fairness. The one thing I did talk about today was the extension of the windfall tax. When we announced our um, uh, uh, package of measures to freeze bills in August, we said that around a third of the money could come from um, from, from a tax on windfall uh, profits being made by uh, the energy giants. But we think that around a third of the package, the 150 billion pound package that is now in place could come from an extension of the windfall tax. And every pound 
that doesn't come through a windfall tax is coming through borrowing and is coming from adding to the national uh, debt. It is really irresponsible to leave that money on the table. The profits that have come on the backs of people's higher bills that have come from Putin's invasion of um, Ukraine. These were not profits they could have possibly dreamt of in their wildest dreams. Even the boss of BP says the company's got more money than they know what to do with. I mean, how many people do we know who have got more money than they know what to do with? I don't think we can do with that money. We could tax it and use it to keep bills low for, uh, for, for everybody else. And that is one contribution we could make to fiscal responsibility and fairness. We're coming to the end of our time, so I'm going to ask each of you to, to wrap up and perhaps um, you could consider what comes next. So Tina, what are your priorities for those that next? And then Rachel, what are your priorities to work on uh, between now and perhaps the next 20 months until the likely general election? So I think for um, the biggest thing right now for business is the energy crisis. And I know it's the biggest thing as well for our citizens too. Um, they're not just paying those energy prices in their little local shops or, or their tiny offices. They're going home and paying them again at home. I think we've got to get on top of that, not for a six-month period, but for the longer term. And I think the plans to really accelerate that by creating uh, new green energies and creating jobs around is fantastic. I think the education system has to be overhauled and overhauled quickly. For, you know, it may work for part of the population, but there's a large part it's not working for. And in certain cases around the country, it's not working for business either. We're not, we're not getting the skills we need. People aren't getting the opportunities they could have. And I think personally, we focus too much on academia as a success instead of looking at entrepreneurial skills. What do we, you know, we give every kid going into university, I, I agree with university, my two kids are sitting in university, but we give every kid 40, 50 grand worth of loans what are we doing for those kids that come out aren't academic and want to start a business they struggle even to get two grand off the local credit union and that's not fair so i think we could do much more to encourage that entrepreneurial spirit by revolutionizing actually and that's an opportunity the education system i'd also love to hear some and things that you can do really quickly uh, if you look at what's happening in finland for the unemployed people they actually gave them their unemployment benefits for a full for the year after they went into work to help them with the adjustment to Deirdre's point there. You know, housing benefit, you you struggle. And I know I've worked with unemployed people for a long time. And when you know what they're going through in terms of struggling with potentially taking a job, not being able to pay your housing benefit, your kids' schools around the corner, the only sport you've got might be down the road. You can't move to another part of the country because you can't pay your housing benefit. That's a big struggle. I know, I'm sorry. I should become a politician. <laughs> She's saying shut up. Um, but I think there's plenty of, you know, I think there's quick fixes, just like the Finns did. You know, I would be, and this isn't the FSB policy, so don't quote me on it, this, this one. I would be in favour of saying that if one and a half million of currently people that don't have jobs pick up the one and a half million vacancies. We get the group, we get extra taxes. I've been favor of saying, don't pay any tax for a year. Come back into work, make the adjustment. Let us help you, give you the support. You're going to help business. You're going to help UK PLC. You're going to get more money to spend on services and we'll be doing better as an economy. So I would just love to see some innovative things as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Um, I think there can be turbulent times ahead in the days and weeks and months ahead if the government continue on the course that they have set themselves. That is bad for our country and it's difficult times ahead for the people who we as MPs and councillors uh, serve in our communities. But for Labour, this is an opportunity to show that we would be different, that we have the vision for the future, but we also have the discipline and the responsibility to manage a crisis like this. And we want people when they look at Labour to think, these people know what they're doing. We could trust our taxpayers' money, our money, with Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves and the rest of the shadow cabinet. And not only that, but we believe that they have got the ideas for our public services, for growing our economy in all parts of the country. And the prize, if we can do that and show that we are the alternative, we are the responsible alternative, is winning at the next election. And after 12 and a half years of opposition, I think we are all ready for that. Thank you. Our events tomorrow. Um, a huge thank you to all of you for attending with your questions and a huge thank you to Tina and to Rachel for joining us. Thank Thanks for us.